Welcome again to another rendition of Wonderful Wednesday in the Word. What a joy, what a privilege, what an ecstasy, what a pleasure to be before you again tonight as we open this grand little book called the Bible and we study it together, we learn together, we apply it together, we grow together, we mature together in our efforts to make heaven our eternal home. What an exciting, exhilarating time to be a member of the Southside Church of Christ. We are growing in leaps and bounds, uh, not only numerically, but more importantly, spiritually. Our youth department uh, will be this week at the last of leaders at the Rosen Center Hotel. And I'm with tip to anticipation uh, in advance, knowing they're gonna do very, very well. We had a preview at Sunday School this past Sunday our puppet show, our song leaders, our presenters, our debaters. I'm very, very proud and thankful for the job all of our youth counselors are doing, led by Melanie and Trevor Williams. But there are many, many more, and I don't want to exclude anyone who are doing a phenomenal job with their time and their sacrifice to God be the glory. Exciting time here at Southside with our youth. And then, of course, uh, two weeks from now is our Do The Must Power Sunday. Asking all of our giving units, and even those of you online, if you want to contribute to our Power Sundays, you can go online and do so and make sure you hashtag it uh, for a Power Sunday. Asking all of our members to give $600 above your regular lay-by to help augment the horrific cost of doing 
things first class in a first class church. And we're just asking you to support us. If you have to mail in your Power Sunday, you know the routine on the uh, P.O. Box. Or if you want to send it in, however you want to do it, we ask all of you to participate. And then we're asking you to anticipate uh, homecoming at the end of May. It's going to be an exciting time as we ordain uh, uh, resident attorney, our lawyer, uh, Tracy McDuffie, he and his beautiful wife, Janelle, and, and Noel, and, and Trey, uh, that family will be added to our leadership module. And we're excited about what he's already doing and looking with tip to anticipation of contributions he'll be making once he's a part of the Southside leadership. And you know by now that would be the celebration also of my 25th year. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? My 25th year as a senior minister of the Southside Church of Christ. There has not been another. I've been the first and the only minister uh, pastor for the Southside Church for 25 years now. I came here in 1999. And with God's help, God's guidance, uh, I think by every matrix, uh, Southside Church has done well, and to God be the glory. Tonight, beloved, believe it or not, we're almost at the end of our parabolic teachings of Jesus. This is parable number 28, and we have one more next week, and that will conclude the parables of Jesus. I cannot believe it. We've been here for months after months after. We started last summer, and now we're concluding next week the parables of Jesus. I again solicit your ideas your help, your suggestions on disciplines of study that we can embark upon. And uh, we never promise that that's what we'll do, but we are interested in your feelings and your ideas. So tonight, let's, beloved, as we prepare to put a lid on these parables, let's talk about the parable of the mustard seed. The parable of the mustard seed. Again, these, these teachings, these stories, uh, these uh, analogies, uh, uh, these uh, compilations of, uh, of parables were his most uh, famous and uh, relied upon tool in his teaching, Jesus, that is. And tonight, let's look at the parable of the mustard seed. Uh, uh, the parables he used, obviously, were more relevant in the first century in ancient Palestine, in their culture, their subculture. But the rep, these stories are still useful to us inhabitants of the kingdom today. Uh, you, you don't know what a mustard seed is. <laughs> it's the smallest seed in Palestine. Uh, it is to this day, when I was there in ancient Israel and toured the whole country, you know by now Israel is a very small country, only 40 miles wide and 20 miles long, uh, 40 miles long and 20 miles wide, that is, uh, you can do the whole country in a week. And uh, so uh, they still rely upon this mustard seed. But for those of you who live in here in Orlando and Central Florida and beyond, uh, these parables have to be explained uh, in graphic detail. And he uses this, this mustard seed that they all knew and related to to teach us the power of fasting and prayer. That, that's what this uh, parable of the mustard seed, the conclusion is for you to have faith of a mustard seed, but this kind of power and faith and miracles comes without, does not come without uh, fasting and prayer. Uh, our whole Mark scripture tonight, Matthew the 17th chapter, verses 19 through 21, but you need to read the preceding verses to get a full understanding uh, uh, of what Jesus is trying to convey in this parable. It really talks about, again, the power of fasting and prayer. It is shown and exhibited in this parable. Uh, both fasting and prayer are important tools in the arsenal of the child of God. Uh, these tools, fasting and prayer, promote our relationship with God and help us to confront and conquer sin and doubt in our lives. I don't know why some Christians in the New Testament church, the Lord's church, have a problem with the concept of fasting. It is a prevalent tool throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Years ago, I did an exhaustive study 
on fasting, and it is still a tool we use at Southside. Anything significant or anything substantial, uh, we will ask the church, usually on a Monday, all who can fast all day. Some because of medical reasons and uh, concerns about their health can only go to noon. Some can't do it at all, but we ask those who can and will to fast and pray that God will intervene. We'll find out tonight in this parable that that was the recommendation that Jesus gave his 12 disciples. Uh, we operate under these three umbrellas tonight. Powerless people uh, will then deal, deal with the practice of prayer and then the power of prayer. You see, the story opens with a uh, <clears throat> man who had a son, epileptic son, seizure in son, who went to the disciples because they had ascertained and diagnosed him of having a demon uh, possessed by an evil spirit. They go to the disciples. The disciples have been deputized, authorized by Jesus to do works and even greater works than he did. And they were not able to cast out this demon, this demonic, uh, demoniac spirit that this young man possessed. And Jesus, as the parable opens uh, in Matthew, the 17th chapter, the 19th verse, he starts talking about how powerless his disciples were, even though they had spent a significant amount of time with him. And the disciples go to Jesus wondering why could we not cast out this demon as the Lord Jesus had instructed? God, what's the problem here? Jesus, look, we weren't able to do this. We couldn't get the job done. We couldn't cast him out. We've been deputized. We've been licensed. We've been empowered by you. We couldn't do it. And Jesus now uses this moment to wrap his teaching around a mustard seed. He exposes their spiritual weakness. They could not cast out this man's demon, according to John 15 and 5, predominantly because of their lack of faith and their lack of belief and their uh, not willing to totally depend and trust God and his son, Jesus Christ. He uses this lesson now to show his disciples how helpless, how weak, how useless they are without God's help, and they don't have the power of God in their lives. Isn't that still relevant today? We can't, Jesus taught in John's gospel, without me, Jesus said, ye can do nothing. Too many Christians and too many churches are trying to do mighty works of God without the spirit and the power of God. We don't have proper preparation. We don't have uh, proper instruction or in training. And he's going to wrap that and he'll capture this in Matthew 17 and 21 by talking about uh, <clears throat> this kind of work. I'm talking about tonight, he says, it does not come without prayer and fasting. And so the first umbrella, he exposes these powerless people. You mean to tell me the 12 had no power? They've been with Jesus. They walked with Jesus. They talked with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They slept with Jesus. They habitated with Jesus. He was in their domicile, and they were in his domicile. So if people who were there with Jesus find themselves powerless, how can you and I be surprised when you see Christians today who seemingly are powerless? because they have broken that covenant relationship with our Lord. And so he exposes them in point number one as being powerless people. Point number two, so he now brings up the practice of prayer. There are two tools he brings up in our arsenal that we want to expose tonight. He says, the practice of prayer and the purpose of fasting. That, that's what he's going to use. Say, well, you guys uh, are weak and powerless predominantly uh, because you don't know how to act, exercise and activate the practice of prayer. That's point number two. Uh, Jesus tells them emphatically, read it again now, Matthew 17. I want you to start earlier than verse 19, but the meat of the lesson tonight is Matthew 17, verses 19 through 21. Jesus says to them, your problem is your unbelief. You couldn't get it done. You couldn't cast them out because you didn't believe. There are many people in Christendom 
who go through the motions, but they really don't believe. There are many people who uh, uh, try to do the things of God, the ministries of God, the work of God. They try to activate the power of God, the usage of God, but they don't really believe it. Uh, you can just be rob robotical. Uh, uh, you can be like a computer turned on and turned off. You can't get anything down of substance with God without faith and believe that God is right and we can do it because he said so. He exposes that in point number two uh, is your unbelief. And so Hebrews 11 and 6 reminds us without faith, it's impossible to please God or work for God. For he that cometh to God first must believe that he is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Jesus even warned that in John chapter 12, verse 37, he said, you know, there are many people who watch his miracles. They saw eyewitnesses, first-hand account of miracles he performed, and they still didn't believe. You know, I, I, I still, again, I have yet, in all my years of being in the church, the Lord's church, the Church of Christ, how many so many people, two people told me when I baptized, uh, miracles are over. You looking at a miracle. I'm probably talking to some miracles. What do you mean miracles are over? The Lord left miracles as an example of his power. Now, I can't do a miracle. You can't do a miracle. But we witness miracles. Every time you see a car flip over seven times and people walk out, that's a miracle. Every time you see the rainbow come after the rain, and, and no scientist with all the data and the information can explain what is a rainbow. That's a miracle, beloved. Listen, my whole life, the position you're in, the blessings you enjoy, some of you have children and you were told you can't have them. Some of you have positions and jobs and blessings that you have no business possessing. Your pigmented, your skin didn't stop you. Your lack of education didn't stop you. Your diagnosis from the doctor didn't stop you. Your, your lack of fluency of speech didn't stop you. Miracles we see every day, and I tell you again, without hesitation or reservation, you watching, you looking, you listening to a miracle right now. And Jesus said, "That's not what's going to make you believe." Matter of fact, when you remember when when Lazarus, the rich, went to the rich man and asked for the food that fell off his table, and the rich man died. His name was Dives, which means rich. He died and went to hell, and Lazarus died and was chilling in Abraham's bosom. And the rich man looked up in heaven. You remember the story. That's not a parable. That's a literal story. And, and, and asked Jesus to uh, send Lazarus back to warn his brothers. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and he said, no, no, no. He said, no, they, they'll believe if one came from the dead and saw that miracle. Jesus said, they have Moses and the prophets. And if they don't believe Moses, the prophet in the word, they won't believe even if one came back from the dead. Miracles are not there to make you believe God. Miracles in the Bible show you and remind you of the power of God. There's absolutely nothing that my God can't do. And so tonight, Jesus said, listen, uh, you don't believe even after witnessing all my miracles. They were there. You know, it's one thing. To hear about a miracle, it's another thing to witness one. If I would have been at the Red Sea and saw Moses stretch out his rod and 12 miles of water, stand up one on this side, and I'm walking down between them, it's like giant aquariums on the right and left, whales and octopuses swimming on the right and the left, and I might, I think I probably believe that. I might have, God probably wouldn't have no problem out of me because I saw it. Now we read it, it's theorem to a lot of people. Oh, my beloved, these miracles are there in the Bible for a reason. I'm not advocating that we have miracle service. I can't heal nobody. I can't perform a miracle. That is never what God was teaching. But what he is reminding you is, no matter what dilemma you face, what obstacle in your life, what, what mountains are in, in your way, God is able. And so tonight, um, the... the the impediment they had was their unbelief. The practice of prayer does not work if you don't believe. Hebrews 3 and 12 says, an evil heart of unbelief leads one away from God. So the picture that Jesus uses now, because of their unbelief, their inability, 
to cast out, even though they've been deputized, they've been licensed, they've been sanctioned. Now, these are apostles. These are disciples. The 12, they couldn't do it. Now, you don't have the same power they have, but he deputized them. So now he said, well, let me captivate this moment. Let me tell you. He said, if you just had the faith the size of a mustard seed, that's the smallest seed in ancient Palestine, but that small mustard seed, almost uh, not visible to the optic nerve, will grow to a substantial size tree. It starts small, a mustard seed, but that mustard tree grows to a gargantuan figure. He's trying to expose us if we just start with the faith small, insignificant, just enough, a little dab will do you. You can do great things in your life. So he uses that mustard seed. He captivates the parable around that small seed that they all understood. He said, just give me some mustard seed, faith fellas, and I'll show you something that you've never seen before. He then goes on to explain, again in Matthew 17, chapter, verses 19 to 21. He says, listen, if you have this, uh, the faith the size of a mustard seed, T nice your faith. You can move mountains and do impossible things and perform miracles. Now he's not talking to you and I. He's talking about what he could do, and he deputized the twelve to do. He says, You can speak to a mountain. Tell that mountain to move from here to there. You can do impossible things if you have the ability to just believe. The possibilities of faith are endless. Matthew 26, 26. Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. Get out of here thinking this has anything to do with you and your power and your education and your smarts and your experience. No, with God, Jesus said in Matthew 26, 26, with God, all things are possible. And then he exposes some power of faith. Mark 9, 23. All things are possible with us if we believe. Yes, uh, with God, all things are possible. And then all things become possible to us if we believe in the power of God. So really, the problem in the story tonight is their lack of belief. And them being hemorrhaged and halted by unbelief. The devil has a... It's a master of creeping doubt into our minds, holding us back that we don't embrace the things that God has promised us. And so he uses that mustard seed. He said, fellas, you don't even need a lot of faith. Just give me the size of a mustard seed. You can speak to a mountain and move it. He said, fellas, give me the, uh, the size of mustard seed and all things become possible with you, with God's help. So this practice of faith, James one and six, James said, we ought to ask or pray in faith and do not waver. For if a man wavers or doubts God, don't let that man believe he can receive anything from God. Don't ask God to heal your mama or your child or bring your child back home if you don't believe it. Don't ask God to help you to finish school and get a good job and become a law-abiding, tax-paying, church-going. If you don't believe it, don't ask God to intervene in your marriage and help your spouse become better and help you to adjust. If you don't believe it, don't ask God to heal this world and, and bless our nation and bless this celestial ball of, of earth. We live. If you don't believe it, don't need you asking. And so tonight, beloved, it hemorrhaged. Their inability uh, was hemorrhaged by their unbelief. And the last umbrella, we talked about the powerless people, the disciples, who ought to have had power. They should have possessed it. They didn't have it. And then he exposes the practice of prayer. Ask and believe. Cast out when you believe. Give me mustard seed type faith. And then he exposes the power of prayer and fasting. He says, now, all you need is belief. But here's what it'll do. He talks about the power of this prayer. He says, uh, the purpose of fasting is to give you power in your prayer. I wonder how many of us don't have enough power in our prayers because we don't know the purpose of fasting. Uh, Southside, I'm going to be asking, talking with our other leaders about getting us as we go into homecoming, go into other things, this uh, academic and this uh, calendar year that we, we put on our calendars maybe once a month 
just a fast. Find some different entity in our church or in our family or in our world that we want to fast and pray about. Yes, the purpose of fasting is to weaken Satan's power in your life. Isaiah 58, 6 and 10. The power of fasting, Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty seven. There are numerous examples of fasting that worked in the Bible. Jonah went to Nineveh and the whole city was converted because they were all encouraged to fast. That's documented again in 1 Corinthians 7 and 5. Uh, fasting is a plan and an action that Daniel used. Remember when Daniel got out that then? And Daniel 9 and 3. The Bible said Daniel fasted. Uh, Daniel 1 and 3, rather. Uh, Daniel fasted. Uh, because, beloved, you got to understand that our power, our ability to believe is enhanced and sharpened when we turn on our plate and physical food, so our focus then, every time your hunger or your thirst arises, it reminds you of the purpose of your fast. And it focuses us, it homes us in, it consecrates us uh, to a single vision of the purpose of our fast. Samuel fasted in 1 Samuel 7 and 6. Moses fasted in Deuteronomy 9, 18. Yeah, people in the Bible, fasted throughout the Bible, and were successful. Pray, he says in Matthew 17, verses 19 to 21, here's the coup de grace. This kind, he's talking about casting out, talking about moving mountains, talking about performing miracles. I'm not telling you to do that today, but things of substantiality, he says this kind does not come without prayer and fasting. All throughout the Bible, Paul in Acts chapter 9, verse number 9, the great apostle fasted. Moses, before his exploits in the Old Testament, Exodus 34, 28, Moses fasted. The sailors with Paul as they went through the storm of Eurachidum and landed on the island of Melita, Acts 27, verse 33. The sailors with Paul, they fasted. Elijah, uh, 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, verse 8, dealing with Rahab and Jezebel, or rather Jezebel, uh, the, uh, the king's wife, uh, he fasted. Anna fasted in the New Testament, Luke 2 and 37. Cornelius fasted uh, in Acts chapter 10. Of course, Cornelius, the first Gentile, first Gentilian convert to the Lord's church in the New Testament. He fasted again, again, and again. Old Testament, New Testament, people who are facing sub substantial things in the Bible had the nerve, the audacity, the chitlins, and the gall. Not only they prayed, but they fasted and prayed. Jesus taught in this parable of the mustard seed. Give me mustard seed type faith, small t nicey faith. And if you couple that with belief, and wrap it around prayer and fasting, there's absolutely nothing the child of God cannot accomplish. With God's help, these things are all possible. It's exhilarating to study this parable of the mustard seed, how Jesus can take something so insignificant, so small, uh, but yet it's timeless and still true to remind us of the power of prayer and fasting and faith small as a mustard seed. Shall we pray tonight? Thankful God we are of your ability to teach us through your word. We're thankful for those who would hear it, believe it, apply it, and grow thereby. Now God bless those amongst us who are dealing with maladies and situations in their lives. Help us to be a comfort one to another. Help us not to be judgmental and uh, condescending and degrading one to another but help us to come to each other's rescue, to each other's aid. Help us to develop mustard seed faith that we can move things with your help. Guide us and lead us with these principles from your parables that they'll be useful and beneficial to us in the days to come. Hide every member of our church behind your cross. Cover us with your blood. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, tonight, beloved, let's keep moving in this prayer. Next week, 
we caps capsule the parables of Jesus and we'll move forward after that. Be guided by God's principles this week. Pray for our children as they go to last leaders and leaderettes this weekend. And we're asking that we have a historic and monumental homecoming and that this becomes another and a long litany of banner years at the Southside Church. Go and be blessed, my friends. Join us every Sunday at Southside, 10 a.m. This Sunday, Bible classes for all ages. Oh, by the way, it's Easter Sunday. Yes, it's Resurrection Sunday. This Sunday, 10 Bible classes for all ages, uh, 11 a.m. Uh, morning worship, uh, live on YouTube and Facebook. And then next Wednesday night, we'll have another wonderful Wednesday in the world again on YouTube and Facebook. Be there with us in person. Uh, bring in Easter with us. We historically have a lot of people come on Easter. We are looking for no less this year. God bless you. God keep you. This is our prayer. Always remember and never forget the lesson of the mustard seed. Good night and be blessed.